Hey guys! This week we will start introducing the brain and the main cells that are so important in receiving sensory information and sending out commands to our muscles. These cells are called nerve cells or neurons. A brain is like a computer. With the mouse, you click on buttons and stuff, so you are sending information to the computer, so it can be processed. Then, after that information is processed, it performs an action as a response, so it opens up a file, or a browser, or whatever it is. So you're sending the information about what you want to happen, it then processes it, and responds with an action. A similar process occurs in your brain. All the time you are receiving information about your surroundings, so maybe you see a rock on the path you are walking on. Your eyes see the rock and send that information to your brain, so it can be processed. As a response, your brain then sends signals to your leg muscles, so you can go around the rock, that way you don't trip on it. This process of receiving information, processing it, and then responding to it, occurs with everything that happens around you. Whether you are in a cold place, so your body responds to it by shivering, or if you're in an anxious situation, so your body responds by making you sweat and by increasing your heart rate. Everything you do, voluntarily or involuntarily, goes through your brain first. But just saying brain is a bit generic. The brain is composed of many parts which have specific purposes, but today we are going to focus on the nerve cells that compose the majority of brain matter. Let's first have a look at what they look like, as they look quite different to other cells that we have talked about before. As you can see from the picture, the nerve cells have a nucleus like other cells, and a cell body called a soma. But unlike other cells, nerve cells have dendrites coming out of the soma. These are like roots from a tree, and their purpose is to receive and transmit information to and from other nerve cells. Then you have a main branch, so to say, called an axon, which extends from the cell body. The axons are insulated with myelin sheaths, and the purpose of these structures is to help transmit the electrical signals in a faster and more efficient way. At the end of the axon, there's the axon terminal. The cell membrane of the neurons is the same as any other eukaryotic cell. It is a lipid bilayer which allows the entrance and exit of ions and molecules either through endocytosis, osmosis, active transport, or facilitated diffusion. It's the movement of ions to the inside and outside of the nerve cells that allows the electrical signals to be transmitted. So a bit like a slot machine. You need to keep putting coins in so you can keep playing, otherwise it just sits there. If neurons don't have ions flowing in and out of them, then the impulses are not transmitted. Ions either have negative or positive charges, if it is either an anion or a cation. The presence of these ions in the nerve cells has an impact on the electrical potential of the cell itself. When it is resting, so when it is not transmitting an impulse, Neurons have a negative resting potential of around minus 60 millivolts. This potential is determined by special pumps on the cell membrane responsible for the transport of sodium and potassium ions. These pumps let a lot of sodium ions out of the cell and only a few potassium ions in, which then creates this negative charge inside the cell. When you receive a stimulus, like a good smell or a nice taste for example, this stimulus is received by special receptor cells on your skin, nose, tongue or wherever the stimulus occurred. 
this stimulus then activates ion channels on the nerve cell membranes, allowing sodium to flow into the cells in large quantities. So when these cells are resting, sodium is being pumped out of them quite fast. But when there is a stimulus, sodium floods these cells, generating an action potential. But this depends on whether the amount of sodium reaches the threshold necessary to initiate an electrical impulse. So for example, for your computer to work, it needs to be charged through a cable connected to a plug. But if this charger does not reach the minimum voltage, it won't do anything to your computer. The same applies here. If the stimulus is quite weak, not enough sodium will flow into the nerve cells, so they won't depolarize enough to reach the threshold, and then no impulse is generated. But, if that threshold is reached, it generates an action potential, and the stimulus will travel all the way to the brain, so that information can be processed. How this impulse travels through the nerve cells can differ from cell to cell. If cells have those myelin sheaths, then the impulse is faster and more efficient, as it jumps over those myelin sheets instead of running through the whole axon. This way, that depolarization that occurs for the impulse to be generated only needs to occur a handful of times in each neuron, instead of on the whole length of its axon. If you think of an obstacle course where you have a pit of mud every meter, you can imagine how it would be much faster to just jump over the mud to get to the other side of the course, instead of going into the mud and then coming out of it, until you reach the end. But we have both types of nerve cells in our body. They just have different functions. When the impulse reaches the end of the axon, called the axon terminal, it connects to the next neuron through a synapse. So when the action potential reaches the axon terminal, it makes the cell release neurotransmitters, which are then caught by receptors on the dendrites of the next nerve cell. So basically, when there is a stimulus, it causes sodium to flood into the first nerve cell closer to that stimulus. This sodium, if it reaches the threshold, causes the cell to depolarize, and an action potential is created, which will then travel through the neuron. It will jump over the myelin and the axon, and then reach the axon terminal. Then, this action potential induces the cell to release neurotransmitters, which were stored in the cell to begin with. And these neurotransmitters are released in the synapse, and then caught by the receptors on the dendrites of the next neuron. And then the whole process is repeated, until the impulse reaches your brain. It sounds quite long, but this actually happens in milliseconds. Another concept you should know about is the refractory period. After an impulse, there is a period of time where you can't get a second action potential to occur. Because the ion levels are all over the place and they basically need to go back to normal before another action potential is generated. So sodium needs to be let out of the cells, and potassium needs to go into the cells, so the neuron can go back to the resting potential of minus 60 millivolts, and then another action potential can occur. It's like going for a sprint. You do your sprint, and then you need a few minutes to calm down, bring your heart rate back down, and then you can do another sprint. But if you were to do it right away, you would probably be too tired. To finish off, let's see what a synapse looks like under an electron microscope. It looks a bit confusing, but if you look closely, you can see the vesicles that carry neurotransmitters pointed out by the yellow arrow. These will be releasing the neurotransmitters into the next nerve cell, called the postsynaptic cell. And that is the end of today's video. Next week we will talk about nerve impulses in more detail, 
and we will see the effects of some drugs on the transmission of impulses. Make sure you check out our Patreon so you can have access to it and to loads more resources. I will see you next week.